today I have with me Amrit Kumar. He's co-founder, president, and chief scientific officer at Zilliqa. He's also the co-chief investment officer of Zilliqa Capital. Zilliqa is a public blockchain launched in 2017 that focuses on decentralized finance and has over 60 developer projects across 20 countries in its ecosystem. And I have with me Michael Korn. He's a chief executive officer and co-chief investment officer at Zilliqa Capital. Michael is co-founder and former CEO of Ether Capital, and his career spans traditional financial services and digital asset space with senior leadership positions in Alliance Bernstein, Society General, Trust Company of the West, Asia West, and Quail Creek Ventures. Zilliqa recently launched Zilliqa Capital as the central business and investment hub for its platform that will invest in decentralized finance projects. Amrit and Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. First of all, tell us a bit more about Zilliqa. What are the key problems that you're looking to solve through your blockchain platform? And what differentiates you from other blockchain platform uh, in the industry, such as Ethereum? When we started Zilliqa, we were looking at the space from two specific, uh, to solve two specific problems. Uh, one was scalability. So we had seen Bitcoin, Ethereum gaining some traction in the, in the community and the space. And the moment they saw that there were people actually using some of these platforms, we started to see scaling problems. So the underlying platform was not able to handle the load that was coming, the transaction load that was coming from the users. And that was very apparent, you know, within uh, the moment the first application of Ethereum went live, uh, for example, in the ICO phase or even the crypto kitties, the gaming applications that went live, Ethereum was basically getting blocked uh, because of the load that was coming from the user base. So that was one problem that we want to solve, so scalability part. So we want to make sure that the platform you know, can sustain a sustainable, a decent number of volume that could come from users. The second thing was we felt that um, when Ethereum became, became popular through its smart contract features, a lot of people started to build contracts, smart contracts that could handle uh, or host or hold substantial amount of money or digital assets. And some of the contracts were actually holding hundreds and millions of dollars worth of assets in, in those contracts. Obviously, when, and again, all of this was happening on a public network, so everyone could see uh, that these contracts were holding these many assets. Obviously, what happened was people started to see opportunities to attack those systems. And so, um, in many cases, uh, 60 or even $100 million worth of assets were stolen or hacked or were frozen in those contracts. So, we felt that uh, this problem needs to be solved because you can't just wait and watch until somehow the systems become secure on its own. We have to take sort of proactive initiatives to improve that, that aspect. So uh, we decided to sort of develop a smart contract language that would be safe for people to build so that when a developer writes a contract and when a user uses those contracts, then they will have a peace, and peace of mind that, okay, my contract, my money will stay safe in those contracts. So these were two problems we wanted to solve, uh, scalability and smart contract safety. That's exactly how Zilliqa started and we, we, we wanted to solve those problems through Zilliqa. How do you differentiate uh, vis -a vis other blockchain platforms such as Ethereum? If you look at today Ethereum, for example, uh, a process around let's say 10 to 20 transactions per second. Now, just to give you a benchmark of how it stands compared to traditional systems like Visa, for example, which is often used as a benchmark. Uh, Visa can process around 5,000 to 8,000 transactions pretty easily uh, on, 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 a, on a regular day. So it shows you that there's an order of magnitude difference between what traditional or classical systems or financial systems require in terms of uh, you know, throughput and capacity and what blockchains like Ethereum or state-of-the-art systems like Ethereum provide today. But Zilliqa, on the other hand, we made tests, uh, we did tests uh, on, on Zilliqa platform. We were able to show that you could process around 2,000 transactions per second. That shows you how, how it comes out. And number two is this idea, and the reason why it works is because this idea of sharding. Where basically, instead of asking the entire not network to process every single transaction, you divide that network into smaller components so that each component can process transactions parallel to the other, other components. So it's basically like, you have, you create departments within a company and each department basically handles a certain uh, number of uh, sort of transactions or, or requests. And so that's, that's one idea that I think now a lot of other chains, including Ethereum are, for example, from, you know, trying to implement this idea of sharding to scale. Mm -hmm. for, uh, for smart contract safety, obviously Ethereum still is very heavily around solidity, which is the preferred language of choice. In a way, it's also a choice. Uh, the, the, the fact that Solity is, is kind of very similar to JavaScript, the language which is most used in web development. It's also in a way, it's the most hated aspect of Solity because people don't like uh, coding JavaScript because they feel that it's very insecure. It's not a language that is designed to 
to guarantee safety to, to, to your contracts and funds. So from that angle, we developed a language called Scylla, which is designed with safety in mind. So some of the contracts uh, that you can that you see today, which are vulnerable, uh, they simply cannot be written in, in that language, in the language that we have designed. So it basically prevents some of the attacks and vulnerabilities exactly at the language level. Is you have a very high throughput and high safety driven protocol that's complementary to Ethereum and many others out there, especially when you look at the low transaction fees that we have, uh, which also creates an environment that's quite ripe for DeFi focused uh, applications, uh, which is one of the reasons why we're uh, one of the leading proponents of the Singapore dollar stablecoin, which uh, behind us and our partner Xfers has become the third most uh, utilized globally behind you know, the, the digital uh, stablecoin dollars and, and digital stablecoin euros. So you know, Singapore is a small country, but packs a mighty punch. And I think a lot of that has to do with Zilliqa, with Scylla and our community. I want to understand a bit more about Zilliqa Capital. So you know, moving from a te pure technology company to an investment arm that is looking to invest into these uh, DeFi projects and also looking to invest into these blockchain projects. What brought about this change? Why the shift from towards investment arm uh, from a pure technology? And what is the key objective of this company? We view Zilliqa Capital as complementary to things we've already been doing within Zilliqa. So one of the benefits that we saw as we were building Zilliqa specifically with Amrit and the other co-founders was the uh, opportunity to help grow starting entrepreneurs. And so they created something called Zillhive, which is a small acceleration seeding platform within Zilliqa. Uh, Zillhive is currently in its ninth cohort of investing. And if you look at the different types of businesses we've invested in, we've seen quite uh, tremendous uh, results. Uh, you have businesses that have been growing and, and in tandem with that have delivered investment results, call it 6x, 10x, or greater than that. You know, certain companies that we've helped grow in and around Zillica, such as Unstoppable Domains, or Switchio, or Zanpool, or Mintable, uh, quite often had follow-on investments from quite notable investors, such as Tim Draper, or Mark Cuban, uh, or Three Arrows, et cetera. So, so one of the things is that this isn't, we don't view this as kind of a step away, but something that's certainly complementary. But one of the things we did notice through Zillhive is that a lot of these businesses, once they kind of grew up past their initial phases, they needed to go to somewhere else for their series A, B, C, D, et cetera, type of investments. So we saw an opportunity to create kind of a large pool of capital that would be uh, really put to work in both that early stages of kind of helping Zillhive extend their dollars to invest alongside them for those acceleration seeding deals, but at the same time to help these companies grow as they need to get additional capital to go through series A, B, C, uh, and, and beyond. Uh, so Zillica Capital is formed specifically as an investment holding company that is complementary to Zillica. Uh, we, we take the companies we invest in and we hold it on our balance sheet. Uh, the value that derives from that in, in this real partnership between us and the companies we invest in uh, is then uh, benefiting to the community of folks that invest around uh, Zillica Capital in that we would then be yielding out to them 65% uh, uh, of our profits. Uh, so that being said, Zillica Capital has really been formed to help fill a gap here in ASEAN and India specifically. Uh, if you look at the region from 60 to 70% of a number of these countries have underbanked or unbanked populations. And, and when you look at the benefits that Zillica can fill in terms of gaps, it really falls into these categories, that high throughput capability, that low transaction fee uh, ability, it really allows for payments, remittances, lending, insurance and investment type of business investments. Uh, beyond that, we also see opportunities in NFT, gaming, as well as your traditional picks and shovels type of infrastructure businesses. And if you look at the board of directors that we've assembled around Zillica Capital, specifically uh, aside from myself and Amrit, uh, we have people that really cross the region of, of, of Asia, into India, into Europe and the US as well. So we make sure that we have good access to the best deals uh, anywhere. How are you funding this? So what, what kind of current corpus are you looking at and uh, where do you get these funds from? Zillica Capital, we're looking at all options to raise funds to bring continuous sustainable investments to the ecosystem and beyond. 
Uh, to date, uh, the majority of the investments we've been making have been off the balance sheet of Zillica proper, uh, but Zillica Capital is uh, looking at all options uh, when we're in the process of raising funds. What's your current corpus and what you're looking at, say, in a year's time? How much have you invested till now? I'd say in, in a year's time, we'd certainly be looking to put to work between $200 million US and above. Uh, that's certainly uh, in line with what we're looking to do. We had said uh, initially when we started uh, this uh, Zillai program, we had around set aside around $5 million worth of, worth of uh, you know, assets to invest. And we have almost consumed uh, that $5 million straight away after okay. over the last three years. If you look about the, the sort of promise of blockchains and DeFi, one of the biggest promises was around helping, uh, let's call it the bank, the unbanked population, right? So people who are who don't have access to financial services, uh, let's say be in India or be in Thailand, be in Indonesia. So the idea was to be able, the vision was to be able to give them access to those services. Unfortunately, today, if you look around and uh, see, look around all the DeFi products and services that are available today, the number of people who actually come from emerging markets that are actually involved in those services is no more than 10%. So, and that's, that's kind of the disconnect, which means that there is an opportunity for us to still go through and make sure that these emerging markets, these products and services, which are around blockchains, can have an impact in these emerging markets. And this is exactly kind of what you know, Zilliqa Capital is, is tar targeting. DeFi is quite broad in perspective. There are a whole stream of projects around it. So in various aspects. So are you focusing on certain specific areas where you see a greater faster mainstream adoption of blockchain services? Uh, is there some, some of these areas where, uh, where you are focusing on? If you look across the space, certainly areas such as payments, remittances, lending, insurance, and investment are most interesting to us. Uh, if you look at kind of the broader marketplace, you know, take remittances, for example, you know, remittances globally in 2018 were around 700 billion US. You know, fees for transferring money across the borders can exceed 20% and sometimes take up to five days. So if you could see just a small 5% savings in that, you're talking about 16 billion US in savings. So certainly if you look at the region, uh, ASEAN, India, et cetera, uh, there are significant remittances in and around the region. So if we could find some kind of real world solution that fills in that gap, that would be amazing. But, but really, the way we're looking at it is we're not looking for one solution. We're looking to put a significant amount of capital to work to help bring about solutions in all of these areas. And to Omri's point, to really help the, the unbanked and underbanked that are, are currently uh, really underserved. The specific areas in DLT technology, the adoption of blockchain in, in Asia, which areas do you find are closest to mainstream adoption? If you think about uh, this, this, this region in particular, and generally speaking for any financial service, some of the first thing that you have to think about is about having a payment method, right? Because no matter what you build, so you can imagine all sorts of, you know, very advanced delivery products and, you know, mortgages and, and insurance and all sorts of things. But there's a basic thing that you need to build first, and that's the payment part. You need to make sure that people like you and me or people who are living in, in remote villages have an easy access to payments. And that's something very powerful. If you, for example, if you take a, take a look at Indonesia, for example, you have people who are sitting in remote villages and getting access to banks, which are in cities, is very complicated for them. So, and, and that's, that's another reason why a lot of these economies are still very cash-based. One method and one problem that some of the startups in that region are trying to do is to be able to bridge that gap. And this is exactly why stablecoin could come into picture because stablecoins are digital assets that are backed by either fiat or other volatile assets. But then the holding of stablecoin doesn't require you to have security like a custodian. You can very easily create a safe wallet and you'll be able to store them into a stable into, into that wallet. That's for example, is one, one key that we have to start with. And once you have the stable coin, once you have a payment method, then you can build all sorts of things, right? You can imagine, for example, building a mortgage. In these countries, for example, it's very hard today, but imagine doing, asking for a micro loan in countries like Indonesia and India and Bangladesh, it's very difficult. But if you are able to build, let's say a system, a peer-to-peer -peer lending infrastructure that allows people, let's say for me, if I have excess dollar, I could basically lend uh, my, my money to a remote farmer in, in, in Bangladesh or Indonesia, that's going to be very powerful. So these are just examples of payments. You can imagine payments. You can imagine uh, having a, a lending uh, platform to be able to get and borrow loans easily at a, at a very small amount. You can imagine insurance products that are again backed by peer-to-peer -peer systems. And these are things that you know, I would say are very specific to these markets that may or may not exist in other markets.
You mentioned that you've got about 60 developer projects on your platform uh, from about 20 countries. How close are these to production uh, and uh, mainstream adoption in the industry? Or are they still at the development stage? Many of these projects are actually live. So we have been working with a company called Experts, which is licensed uh, by MAS, uh, the regulatory body in Singapore. And the idea with Experts was to be able to issue a Singapore dollar backed stable coin. So stable coin, a tokenized, basically a tokenized dollar. And you know, as my convention, if you look at all the tokenized assets today uh, across all currencies, of obviously USD because of its, you know, it's, it's a global reserve currency, it's obviously the highest, uh, I think uh, the number of USD is obviously uh, in, in billions. But if you look at, uh, and the second is euros, again, for obvious reasons. And the third one, which surprisingly is Singapore dollars. And, and one of the reasons why, uh, so number of Singapore dollars that have been issued today in tokenized form is around 30 million, three zero. And it's still the highest and one because of the community that's actually using this. So today, for example, there's a large community of users in Singapore and uh, you know, using Zilliqa's infrastructure who are using these stable coins to do all sorts of things, especially uh, participating in DeFi activities and DeFi products in the blockchain ecosystem. So that's, for example, that's one example of how, uh, you know, one of the products are actually being used today. The other example is around a GX, which is again, uh, an exchange, a securities exchange, you know, again, approved by MAS, uh, which allows people to trade, uh, you know, private equities, or you can imagine commodities. Very recently, we tokenized um, private whiskeys. So casks of whiskeys that you could buy from uh, Scotland. And these, these are basically tokenized on top of Zilliqa. You can actually buy, you know, instead of buying the whole cask, you can now buy, let's say, a liter or two liters of uh, a bottle of whiskey from the tokenized assets. But again, you can imagine extending these to all sorts of things, for example, tokenized real estate. So today you could invest and buy a part of a building and not buy the whole building or buy a small part of the apartment or the whole apartment. So these are things that are already happening and people are actually using some of these services already uh, in the existing uh, you know, system that we have. How are you building your ecosystem now? What are the initiatives that you are undertaking to uh, grow your ecosystem? Things needs to be built uh, sort of in phases, right? And you start with stable coin. Once you have a stable coin, you imagine uh, building let's say uh, more assets. Once you have more assets, for example, let's say tokenized shares, tokenized uh, real estate. Once you have more, more of these assets, you need a platform where people can trade them. So you need a marketplace for them to trade. Once you have those, then you need to be able to uh, build something like an asset management tool. So you need to be able to give people access to, to products that allows them to say, okay, here is, I can see my portfolio and I can see where my money is going and I can see how my money is being spent. And then you can imagine all sorts of complex, uh, let's say, as, you know, blockchain backed asset managers, basically. So you don't want people to manage your assets. You could even have contracts managing your assets. You define uh, what sort of assets you can, would like to invest in. You would define how much risk you are willing to take. And then the con contracts, you know, based on different parameters decides which one would fit the best for you. And then you can actually see in a transparent manner where your money is going. Instead of, let's say, sending your funds to, let's say, uh, as asset manager in the traditional world, where you have close to zero. You have very little sort of you know, visibility on how much, how much and how your money is being spent in all sorts of things. Now you literally can see funds moving from your wallet to other assets, other you know, players and other products. You can literally see how your money is making more money for you. So these are kind of things that sort of gets developed in Lego manner, right? So you start with a piece, you put another piece together and then you build pieces around that basic piece. That's kind of how things are being structured today. Want to get a sense of the growth that you are seeing in your system, also not just in terms of the developer projects, but also in terms of the transactions that are, that is uh, running through your platform. So, can you share with me some KPIs and uh, show, yeah, show me the growth? Definitely. So, if you look at the numbers today, every second the platform today processes around five hundred dollars uh, worth of transaction every single second. So, it basically tells you the economic activity, and this is something that has obviously grown rapidly in the last, I would say, year or so. Uh, I don't have exact numbers what what we had uh, in two thousand nineteen. But I'm very confident that it at least 10 x uh, in, in the last year or so. So that gives you uh, the nature of how active the platform is. So every second you see people transacting uh, an economic activity around $500 per, per second. Now, if you look at the total uh, number of transactions that has grown rapidly in the last uh, year, year or so. So um, let's say around 2018, it took roughly speaking three months for the network to receive 1 million transactions from people. Today, Roughly in a month's time, you are seeing the same transaction volume. So roughly it takes a month for the network to, to receive 1 million transactions to process. So again, so roughly speaking, it has tripled. The time has sort of 
one third over the last year or so. Uh, we have, we launched, for example, a staking program that allows people to put their zills to work uh, by securing the network and providing services. You have seen around $900 million worth of assets in the staking already deployed and being used. Uh, I mentioned about uh, stablecoin, you know, XSGD. Uh, when we launched a year ago, the number of XSGD tokens that was launched was less than a million. Today, it's over 20 million. So it shows you, uh, these are kind of examples that show you how the network has been you know, going in a rapid expansion rate. A number of people, number of users using those platforms is going, is going at a rapid rate as well. What's your revenue model here? And what kind of revenue growth you are seeing in your platform? The revenue model is obviously around investments, right? So we, we see potential projects that come to a platform who are interested in building good projects. So we invest in them. The second is we participate in some of those products ourselves, right? So we have, for example, uh, a, a platform that allows people to, to trade assets, right? So we, we provide, for example, liquidity to those assets and through those, uh, you know, by providing liquidity, we earn, we earn money. Obviously, we also did a fundraise back in 2017, 18, that allows us to, that gave us initial funding that to survive. And now we are at a stage, we are actually generating quite a bit of revenue, uh, uh, you know, per, per, per quarter uh, in, in the last uh, year or so. So that's something that's quite positive, but yes, you know, again, this is exactly why we feel that Zilliqa Capital is something that's going to be very important because we are now seeing not just within Zilliqa, but even around Zilliqa, right? We are seeing opportunities where people are building cool projects. People are building interesting applications that consumers would like to use. And in order to grow that ecosystem, in order to one benefit from that opportunity, Zilliqa Capital will obviously come in and say that, look, here's a good project that wants to build and wants to build and serve this, this population. And here's, uh, the tickets that, that go to these projects and then obviously make money through those investments. There's also an ability right now for Zilka proper to generate revenues directly through working with projects to help them through bespoke solutions to help them kind of get up to, and to scale. So I think that's another way that, that Zilliqa is also benefiting from growing its ecosystem. But certainly, you know, from a complementary perspective with Zilliqa Capital, uh, we certainly would make money from our investments, from revenue sharing, profit sharing, as well as equity holdings, uh, as well as token investments and, and other opportunities that bring both current yield and kind of longer tail value. And, and the, the main thing about Zilliqa Capital is we're certainly focused on Zilliqa specific businesses, but at the same time, we can be chain agnostic because we do see opportunities, as Amrit mentioned, on Ethereum or on other chains as well. And we think that if we can get them into kind of our wheelhouse of investments, we can help encourage them to move towards Zilliqa and then take things from Zilliqa and help bring them to other chains. And you know, even to date, we have Zill chain to Polychain poly Network. We have Zill to Binance. Uh, we have Bill to Ethereum that's in play in terms of a bridge. So we, we feel there's gonna be lots of this kind of cross chain functionality and we wanna make sure we're, we have a seat at the table. Is Zilliqa financially sustainable? Also, you're looking at funding a substantial amount, uh, about $200 million uh, in, through Zilliqa Capital. So now, are you looking to raise more funds to fund those projects? And are you also looking to raise funds to finance Zilliqa as a platform? What's the mechanics here? Zilliqa, the protocol is certainly financially sustainable on its own. It, it's growing by leaps and bounds. You know, the token ecosphere around Zilliqa, the Zill grew 1700% last year. That's compared to 400% for Ethereum, 300% for Bitcoin. Uh, and as Amrit mentioned, from a transaction perspective, basically any metric you look at, Zilliqa, the protocol is growing tremendously globally. We continue to put uh, funds to work through Zillhive, and that is coming off of uh, the Zilliqa balance sheet. But Zilliqa Capital is outside of that. And so the funds that Zilliqa Capital will be using are being raised uh, by Zilliqa Capital specifically. Challenges that we're seeing in blockchain. So uh, Amrit mentioned to me earlier about uh, sharding as a technology, how you are improving the scalability and also scale uh, through which you are improving the security. Continuing from that, what is the current transaction per second that you're being able to achieve uh, using this sharding as a technology and also like even Ethereum, for example, is exploring sharding. So how are you differentiating the two? How are you kind of differentiating your uh, technology in, in sharding space? In terms of numbers, so Ethereum, as I mentioned, around 10 to 15 transactions per second. And the impact of this uh, you know, scalability is definitely sh shows up in terms of transaction fees. So today it's quite possible 
that, uh, or at least uh, yesterday, it was quite possible that if you made a transaction of $15, you might be paying $20 as gas fee. So as a fee for the network to process that transaction, which is obviously just doesn't make sense, right? On the Zilliqa side, we, uh, we are can process around 2000 transactions per second. So which is orders of magnitude higher than what Ethereum and existing uh, platforms do today. If you transact on Ethereum, you pay around, let's say $10 for even a simple transfer of Ether. While if you transfer Zils on the Zil, which is the token on the Zilka chain, if you transfer those tokens, it costs you one tenth of a penny or even, even, even less than that. So that, that sort of gives you a sense of how scalable and how usable the platform is. In terms of the actual technology that's being used, there are certain differences. One is that we are, we are in a way pragmatic about building things because we are building things from scratch. You know, we know that we can take all sorts of risks that we wanted to, to build because we're building from scratch while Ethereum is something that has been running for ages, right? It has been running. It's like, it's like you have a building set up and ready, and now you're trying to fix the foundation. So it becomes very tough, right? To fix those things. That's kind of the reason why Ethereum foundation, foundation when it started to work on sharding, it has a phased approach to building things. So it has at least four or five phases. And only when they reach around a phase four, that you'd be able to see actual sharding come into practice. And currently Ethereum is at phase zero. So, and one, so that's one problem. The second problem is very challenging. You know, as I mentioned, it's once you have built your platform, once all sorts of applications are already running, it becomes very challenging to make sure that those platforms can sort of be backward compatible once the sharding gets implemented. So that's a huge challenge for Ethereum. Again, I'm looking forward to what, what comes out uh, from Ethereum Foundation, but it's, it's something that's really, really difficult. So it's not an easy thing to do. And this yeah. has been going on since I founded Ether Capital back in 2017, 2018, you know, uh, Sharding was supposed to be the silver bullet that was right around the corner back then. And here we are almost three years later and it still is in process. So, so I, th I think that certainly helps to drive traffic towards Zilliqa and is a really competitive advantage for us in what we're trying to do. Blockchain as a technology has passed through various phases. So there was once upon a time, a lot of hype around it. Then there was a measured skepticism, I would say. And then there was a growing momentum. So uh, th th there have been a lot of phases. Now, what do you see are the biggest challenges in blockchain adoption in the industry today? Besides sharding as a technology, how are you looking to solve it? Interoperability is also a very big challenge because uh, there are multiple, we've got thousands of blockchain platforms and uh, they're not uh, interoperable with each other. So how do you solve these kind of big challenges that come in uh, blockchain space? Obviously one is around scalability. And you know, to get a sense of how big this problem is, today, if you look at just Ethereum, for example, we have around 140 million addresses today. The number of people who are actually using DeFi is in tens of thousands, which gives you a sense of there are a large number of people who hold assets, who hold it. Again, this extends to Bitcoin as well, so it's, it's, it's not just specific to Ethereum. There's a large number of people who, are, have, who hold assets and who hold these assets, but they're not involved in any of these DeFi activities. Or not involved in, or probably have never used any of the dApps that are out there. So that's that's a very sort of shocking statement because it, it looks like less than I don't know one percent of people who are actually uh, you know even involved and using any of the dApps. That clearly shows that even with these small number of users, you already are hitting scalability issues. Now imagine if you actually go with a you achieve at a point where let's say fifty percent of the all addresses or people who hold assets actually start using those dApps, that's going to be a catastrophic sort of situation, right? For the real, uh, from a platform perspective. I also mentioned about this emerging market, right? Less than 10% of people from the emerging market are actually using some of these DeFi products. So that's, that's one challenge is around making sure that the platform remains scalable, making sure that you can attract or the actual crowd who actually wants to use some of these platforms, number one. Number two is if you look at the platform, how capital efficient these platforms are today. So let's say, in the real world, uh, if let's say if you want to get a mortgage or want to get a loan for for your for your apartment, if you're mine, right, you you don't put 500 collat person collateral on your to, to borrow that loan. While in case of DeFi today, because of the way system is is it doesn't have a credit system, system doesn't require you to have KYC. You are actually required for every dollar that you take, you have to put five dollars as collateral, and that makes the whole system very inefficient. The third point is around uh, I would say you know key management. Today, in order for you to actually get hold of any ETH or any asset, it's quite painful as a user base, you know, as a, from a user's perspective. You first have to go and download a, you know, a wallet and uh, figure out how to manage your private key and public key. And once you have figured that out somehow, then you land up and you have to go to Binance or other platforms to buy some of those assets. 
that's quite quite painful from a user experience perspective. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we still have a long way to go to be able to establish ourselves. Or no, generally, I'm talking about blockchain in general, to start with blockchain as a platform where people can easily use some of these services. Aside from the usability constraints, and certainly when you have people at the table, the, the, the way I like to look at it is if you look at the trajectory of Bitcoin, right? So started at a dollar and it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But, but the overall trajectory is up. Um, and I think that is pretty much akin to the development of the broader blockchain and digital asset space. So, you know, wh when I entered this marketplace around 2016, it was still very nascent and there weren't really too many real applications, things you can use to, to do cross border transfers or to do payments or anything. Um, slowly, step by step, you've had institutions step into the business. So the difference between now and even 2018, three years ago, is you now have tremendous institutional interest globally uh, at the table. You have uh, CBDCs, you know, uh, country denominated uh, digital currencies coming to market or in the pipeline, uh, whether that's in Europe or the US or in China. You have real banks, uh, Boney Mellon, Fidelity, et cetera, that have custody solutions that they're putting to work uh, globally. You have real asset management companies, BlackRock, JP Morgan, et cetera, putting capital to work in this space. So you slowly are seeing the economy pick up from an institutional perspective. You slowly see economies coming into it from a governmental perspective. And I think this is giving a lot more confidence to the retail potential investor and to other institutions as well. So as Omri mentioned, it's still super early days in terms of the percentage of capital that's being allocated into the space or being put to work in the space, but it feels like it's the foundation of something much greater. Uh, and a lot of that also, even when you look at the US specifically, you have a lot of these companies now being actually given banking charters, which three years ago would have been unheard of. So I think what you'll ultimately see is a lot of these governments put in place kind of a real true regulatory sandbox to kind of define the rules for people to play in. Uh, and then once you have that, it's kind of the sky's the limit. What we're seeing today is that there is this gap is closing every day. So for example, traditional banks are now allowing people to, as Michael mentioned, allowing people to uh, you know, custody their crypto assets in, the, in their banks. At the same time, some of the pure DeFi projects are applying for licenses. You know, for, you know, there are people, for example, Aave Protocol, which is one of the uh, popular uh, lending platform on, on Ethereum. It has now applied for a license in the UK to be able to offer certain services to these users. So you see that this, this convergence sort of getting closer and closer. Revolut, for example, is one of the challenger banks in the UK and outside the uh, UK. They, for example, today offer you uh, to, to buy Bitcoins, Ethereum, and some of the other assets directly within their app. So in a way, this is something that traditional banks, you know, banks, let's say the older banks would not have dared, uh, you know, a few years ago, but now they're quite openly offering their consumers and their clients access to those assets. So this, this, this bridge is sort of closing in from both sides, so both from the traditional financial landscape, they are coming closer towards accepting how uh, these assets should be held and you know, controlled and given to their clients. At the same time, uh, purists of blockchain are also sort of exploring the ideas of how we can you know, get licenses and be able to provide services in a, in a legally compliant way. Are you seeing a specific trend or, or a difference between Asia, uh, um, Asia and India, uh, ASEAN, APAC as a region, versus uh, the rest of the globe uh, in terms of uh, DeFi development, so de decentralized finance development? Amrit touched upon financial inclusion as one area earlier. But other than that, are you seeing anything specific that stands out? We're seeing global growth and creation happening everywhere. I think the main difference you see is the availability of capital. Traditionally, you see significant amounts of capital coming out of Silicon Valley in the US and a lot of US centric projects or European centric projects that are growing. And it's a lot more difficult for someone building in Asia or in India to get that kind of attention. So that's certainly one reason why we want to create Zilliqa Capital to create a counterbalance to the wealth concentration or the funding concentration that's coming out of Silicon Valley. Uh, but I think there's a number of projects that are being built in the region that have grown uh, quite tremendously. The problems are, and that you see today in, in those regions in APAC is very different from the problems that you'd see uh, in, in, let's say, the Western world, right? And those problems means that you need to build very specific products and services to tailor to those requirements and needs. And those who are building those things, they are definitely being successful. 
But the problem is that today, those people who are building these products, often, as Michael mentioned, you have to sort of seek funding from outside because it's very difficult for them to get funding locally sometimes. And that kind of sometimes what happens is, you know, while you're sort of reaching and pitching out to Silicon Valley VCs, your idea sort of dries out, uh, you know, you lose traction, you lose momentum, and then obviously sometimes you just drop off. So the idea behind Zilliga Capital was to sort of set up and cover that region and bridge the gap between what you see sort of active investments going on in the Silicon Valley and the investments or the products coming out of, of India and let's say Malaysia and Indonesia and Philippines. So there are quite a few activities coming on out of these countries and it's just about bridging that gap by providing them you know, ready to go capital that they can put to use and make sure that they can grow uh, using, the, using that capital. Tell me about your future roadmap in the next 12 months or so, both for Zilliga Capital as well as Zilliga. From a Zilliga Capital perspective, uh, our intention right now is to look at all options to raise funds uh, so we can bring continuous sustainable investments uh, to the Zilliga ecosystem and beyond. Uh, and that's what we're kind of laser beam focused on right now over the next uh, number of months. And then once that uh, target is hit, then we will immediately move to uh, putting that capital to work uh, through investments. On the Zilliqa platform side, as you can imagine, once you, once you start a platform, there are all sorts of things that you have to cater to, right? One is you have to cater, cater and think about how to improve that platform because as a software, it never, you know, you have to, it never stops. So you have to keep improving the platform. So, and, and the two key areas in which we would like to improve the platform uh, aspect. One is uh, making sure that the throughput goes up. So we have to optimize what we have built so that the network can process more and more transactions per second. We have to reduce the latency so the time it takes for your transaction to be processed by the network should go down as well. So these are two main areas in which we want to improve on, on for, for our platform. Then we also want to make sure that because we define and design a new language, we have to make we have to make sure that we are this is what we're working on today as well is making sure that the developer tools are ready for, for people to use. In terms of building the ecosystem, that's a bigger thing, right? So you have to make sure that we, for example, so far we have developed and uh, with, with, with the help of our partners, a stable coin that uh, caters to Singaporean uh, you know, mass. We are also looking into issuing an Indonesian rupiah backed stable coin, again, with the help of our partners. Uh, we are looking into through interoperability because we believe that there are going to be projects and there are going to be builders who would not be dogmatic uh, about which platform on, they build on, but they would be open about seeking the consumers. So if they see that there's a platform out there where there's 100 million users or, 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 or a million users, and I would like to attract those users to, to use my, 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 my product. So we are also building sort of interoperability projects where people who are building on Ethereum would be able to move some of their assets or even the entire application on top of Zilliqa and be able to provide that to the consumers on the Zilliqa platform. And so we have uh, so far a DEX that have, we have already built that allows people to trade, trade uh, you know, fungible assets. We also have a NFT marketplace called Mintable that allows people to tokenize or digitize, let's say, their artwork, uh, so painting, it could be all sorts of things. And so we are also improving some of the features that people are requesting from, from a, let's say, an auction house. So a lot of work is being done on building the different pieces that are needed for an ecosystem to prosper. So that's that's kind of the what's going to happen in the next um, year or so. So I want to thank Amrit and Michael, both of you, for joining us today, thank giving you. us a very good perspective on two developments that we are seeing in ASEAN, uh, both with regards to uh, blockchain development, as well as how you are trying to solve these various challenges of scalability, interoperability um, that is existing in the uh, blockchain industry today. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.